tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Uh, last night's call was number 141. Record-breaking rescue. After another call out last night, it's the busiest year ever for North Shore Rescue. Plus, they found a allegedly found a rodent in the um, in the soup. Nasty surprise or cruel hoax? A gas town restaurant reeling after a post on social media and. It's really busy, busy. I would say it's the busiest night of the year. Midnight Madness. How to get home safely after the celebration on New Year's Eve. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. It's not a record they wanted to break, but with the rescue of two lost dog walkers early this morning, North Shore Rescue has now broken its record for the highest number of callouts in a year. Volunteer teams responded 141 times in 2018. Our John Hernandez now on why so many adventure seekers keep getting into trouble. The record-breaking call happened late last night when two young hikers walked their dog just east of Grouse Mountain. They spotted a cougar and ran away into the woods. Then they were lost. After they'd lost the trail, uh, then they, they couldn't recover. They ended up in the mosquito drainage, uh, mosquito creek drainage, uh, which is very, very gnarly uh, terrain. Stranded on steep cliffs, the hikers called 911 and were stuck in the cold wilderness for hours. It wasn't until after midnight that 15 rescuers reached them. Well, they were very cold because uh, we told them to stay in one place because uh, that way they're not a moving target. And so uh, the female had very cold feet, so we had to reclothe her. North Shore Rescue has now responded to 141 calls over the calendar year, and that's a record. It's not one they wanted to break, but they can't help it if more and more people are going into the backcountry. You never know when you're out here, right? Crews attribute the increase in calls to general population growth. On a snowy day like this, parking lots on the mountains are full. There's beginners and plenty of veterans, but even the most experienced say everyone should be cautious. You can come out for an hour and think you're going to be perfectly safe. The 40 minutes into it, run into a problem. Quite frankly, none of that stuff weighs very much. A couple of little space blankets, a first aid kit. Officials are urging novice users to stay within marked boundaries. These are volunteers. We don't want them unnecessarily having to put themselves in any danger because someone made a poor choice about going into the backcountry. And when night falls early, there's one item that can make a world of difference. Carry a flashlight. It's, they're so small, they're so light. And a flashlight will get a lot of people out of a lot of trouble uh, on a regular basis. Rescue crews expect their workload to increase in the years ahead and for more records to be broken. John Hernandez, CBC News, West Vancouver. Of course, it wouldn't be a busy day on the mountains without some traffic snafus. We checked out the Cypress Bowl um, website. 10 centimeters of snow in the last 24 hours. Time to go play. Today's flurries meant fun and games across the North Shore, but only if you could make the drive. Our camera is spotting at least one car pulled over to the side there. Police are reminding drivers to change their tires to avoid delays and dangerous situations. Even if you somehow manage to make it up the mountain with your inadequate tires, now you face coming down the mountain with very limited braking capabilities and very limited steering uh, capabilities. Anyone looking to visit the North Shore is urged to have Alpine tires or even those with the M plus S symbol. Winter tires are mandatory on most provincial highways until March 31st. A restaurant in Gastown is trying to figure out how a rat ended up in a bowl of soup. Vancouver Coastal Health has since shut down an off-site commercial kitchen following an inspection this morning. And restaurant staff are now in damage control in the wake of a video that's gone viral. The CBC's Tanya Fletcher has the story. It all centers around the Crab Park Chowdery in Gastown. And it all started with this video posted to Instagram Thursday afternoon. What is this? Oh my God, it's a dead... <gasps> The restaurant's owner was asked about the authenticity of the video as the post is so far unverified. It seems a bit suspect and that, you know, a rodent of that size would end up in a bread bowl that's that big with a rodent that big. Like it just doesn't, it, a lot of it doesn't add up. We're not pointing fingers or saying that, uh, that anything was done there. We just want to find out the actual truth. 
He says he's baffled as to how a rat could have got into the soup. And we have their, their 20 liter Lexons that have smooth surfaces. So for a rodent to be able to climb up the side of those is almost, impo sorry, is almost impossible. Their soup is made off site at a commercial kitchen in East Vancouver. Vancouver Coastal Health inspectors visited both locations following complaints. While the Crab Park Chowdery restaurant is allowed to stay open, its off site kitchen has been ordered to close. When we found out that the chowdery staff make the soup at another location, Mamie Taylor's, we immediately inspected Mamie Taylor's. And there we found evidence of rodents. So we immediately closed Mamie Taylor's restaurant and commercial kitchen. Mamie Taylor's has had previous health violations. In July, inspectors found evidence of rodent activity and issued a fine. In September, inspectors then found the issue had been resolved. Until now. As for the people who posted the video, they are refusing to answer our questions, other than saying they were given a full refund and $100 gift card. Still, the publicity damage has been done. We've got like 28 one-star reviews on, on Google just as of 3 a.m. And same thing with Yelp. Like, people just see it, they see a story, and they just start running with it without actually ever coming down and meeting us and knowing who we are. The video has been viewed thousands of times on social media. Still, the restaurant's owner is hopeful his business is able to bounce back. It's unfortunate that a picture um, is worth a thousand words, but hopefully the words that you hear here today will, will help to um, alleviate some of that pain for you. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Vancouver. Vancouver police say they have found no evidence to corroborate claims that a six-year-old was lured away from Sexsmith Elementary School. Police say they've investigated public tips, interviewed staff and students, reviewed video footage, and canvassed neighborhoods, but cannot verify the original story. These allegations date back to the start of December, when the girl was allegedly lured off Sexsmith Elementary property and sexually assaulted. Investigators say they felt it was important to update parents, staff and students and that the investigation is still ongoing. An overrunning fire in Maple Ridge has left one woman in hospital and reduced a building to rubble. First responders were notified just after 1 a.m. They arrived to find a large shed that houses a portable washroom business engulfed in flames. Maple Ridge Fire says it found one woman on scene suffering smoke inhalation. She was the one taken to hospital cause of this fire still under investigation. While getting home after New Year's Eve celebrations can be a real challenge in Metro Vancouver. With so many people trying to get home at the same time, it's tough for taxis and transit to keep up. The CBC's Tina Lovegreen reports on the options available, hopefully, to get you home. After the clock strikes 12, there can be a big rush to get home. Black top taxi driver Siru Strahmatian knows about it all too well. I would say is the busiest night of the year. He'll be working New Year's for the 26th time. No matter what you do, there is a little bit of waiting time. He says with everyone pouring out of the clubs and parties at around the same time, demand just outstrips supply. It doesn't matter how many number of cabs we have on the road, there is way more people trying to flag down a cab. So his best advice for getting a cab? Best advice, I think, flag one down. He says it can be nearly impossible to get through to dispatchers. Another option is to book a designated driving service. And we sent a team of two drivers. One will drive you and your vehicle, and the other one will pick and follow behind. These services are more expensive and cost roughly $50 for the first 10 kilometers. But they too are expecting an extremely busy night. But the more advanced notice, the more guarantee of getting your ride when you would like to get picked up. But if you want to save some money, you can catch a free ride on transit. So this is the 43rd year and running. It's free transit from 5 p.m. to 5 a.m. And there are extended hours, too. SkyTrain will run an hour later than normal. If you did miss the last train getting home, you could head over to, uh, to Granville Street and West Georgia, and that's where the night bus district is. Vancouver police anticipate it will be a very busy night. They will have more officers on duty, and you may find yourself going through more than one roadblock. So whichever method you choose, plan ahead and try to exercise some patience. Everybody get home. You might wait half an hour, 45 minutes, 30 minutes, 15 minutes, depends on your luck. But I, I believe, and I am strongly believe that everybody gets safely home. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Vancouver.
More than 1,000 B.C. Hydro customers are still in the dark tonight following last week's powerful windstorm. B.C. Hydro estimating about 1,600 people are without power, many on the southern Gulf Islands. Today, about 70 crews were in that area working to fix the problems. The utility company says full power should be restored by December 31st. You can see a revised list of estimated completion dates for the affected communities on our website, cbc.ca slash bc. The opening of Vancouver's first legal marijuana store has been delayed by a week. Evergreen Cannabis Society was set to open its doors tomorrow, but in a tweet, the store says it's dealing with holiday-related delays at Vancouver City Hall. That means potential pot customers will have to wait until January 5th for the store's grand reopening. Durex is issuing a Canada-wide recall on certain batches of its Real Feel condoms after they failed a shelf life test. Real Feel 20 packs and Real Feel Extra Lubricated 10 packs both affected in this recall. Health Canada says the 20 pack specifically is expected to be less durable at the end of its shelf life. You can find the affected batch numbers on our website, cbc.ca slash bc. Durex says anyone who bought recalled condoms should be able to return them for a refund. Team Canada holding on last night against a surging team Switzerland to move to a 2-0 record at the World Junior Championships here in Vancouver, now sitting alone atop their division. They got their first break today before taking on the Czech Republic tomorrow, and they took some time to talk with reporters. And our Dan Burrett is here with more. Dan, Canadians are pretty excited to see a perfect record uh, for the team so far, but how do the people on the team feel about their play? Mike, from coach to players, they say it's good, but not great. Yes, Canada is undefeated so far, but as we saw last night, they gave up two power play goals to a team many thought they would handily beat, the Swiss, especially after that 14 nothing drubbing they had at Denmark. Team Canada coach and former Vancouver Canuck Tim Hunter kept it blunt and personal. He said his players were asleep on the penalty kill. He told the squad they aren't as good as their family and friends tell them they are, and he even kept a few players who had been underperforming off the ice late in the game last night. Point taken. Expect more from everybody, and uh, those guys didn't have a great game. And, you know, I mentioned it last night, and uh, they'll learn from it. We'll talk to them. We weren't as good as, uh, you know, a lot of people think we were in that first game. There was still uh, definitely room for improvement. I think, uh, you know, we knew that going into the second game. And, uh, you know, I think we made uh, some adjustments, but uh, obviously there's still uh, lots of room for improvement here. And Dan, of course, so repeating last year's championship is uh, the goal again this year. How's the team looking ahead to the games that are uh, still to come? Well, the next two are much harder challenges, Mike. They play the Czech Republic tomorrow night. That squad has several NHL prospects on the team, so our squad says it's time to step up. Have a listen. Czech and Russia, those are two top teams, so I think um, we do have an extra gear to give, and I think uh, we should have to limit our mistakes and uh, bear down on our chances against them. We're going to be a lot better against the Czechs than we were last night against the Swiss. We have, uh, like I've mentioned, uh, lots of things to clean up, but I'm confident in our group and confident in our coaches and our players that we'll, we'll get better as we move along here. So after the Czech Republic game, they then face off against their old cold nemesis, Russia, on New Year's Eve Monday. Russia also has several NHL prospects on its squad. So either way, it's going to be a fun tilt. Mike? Should be. We'll look forward to the games. Thanks, Dan. Well, another cold and wet day here on the south coast. Even a sprinkling of snow in a few places around Metro Vancouver. Janine is here now with uh, your first look at the forecast. Grayus, thanks so much for having me here. We have a little bit of an active weather day for today into tomorrow for parts of BC. In fact, there are some special uh, weather statements, snowfall warnings, winter storm warnings, rainfall warnings that are in effect for parts of BC. Areas highlighted in the green, you're under that rainfall warning, about 50 to 70 millimeters of rain. And then for snowfall warnings, 
up north, Prince George to Dawson Creek, 15 to 25 uh, centimeters. And it's also going to be fairly windy, so there is a chance of blowing snow and poor visibility, especially along Highway 97. Winter storm warning as we head further south, about 30 centimeters expected for uh, these areas along the passes there. So we're going to continue keeping an eye on that. A quick look at what we can expect for the overnight, 11 p.m., 5 degrees, showers moving in for Vancouver, and then it continues into tomorrow as well. I'll let you know how much you can expect and when it's going to taper off. All right, Janine, thanks. We'll talk to you in a bit. Well, if you're just joining us, you can catch up on what you missed online. Just visit us on YouTube. A link should be on the screen right now. There it is. A special thanks to those of you who are already with us there for helping us reach 1,000 subscribers. If you're not subscribed yet, you can watch the show live, commercial free, and find our featured stories for you to watch at any time. Well, it's a good time to fill up your car. Gas prices are set to dip right across the country, but not for long. We'll tell you the reason why next. And good evening to our viewers online. If you've been putting together your New Year's resolutions, chances are more exercise might be pretty high on the list. Well, there's a new trend trying to capitalize on that ambition, but as Diane Buckner explains, this pursuit is pretty pricey. High five. Yeah. Sasha Exeter played competitive tennis as a teen. Fitness has always been an important part of her life. You want to turn the page? But since giving birth to her first child, getting to the gym has been a challenge. So she's bought herself a $3,000 internet-connected bike from Peloton and signed up for the company's $49 a month subscription service. I love it because I can actually query through my favorite instructors. And I love Robin Arzon, so I'm gonna do her class. There's a library of spinning classes included in the package. <laughs> She can also join a live class happening in a studio in New York City if she wants. Peloton is just one of a number of companies offering high-tech exercise in your own home. Fitness uh, traditionally has been a destination activity, right? You packed up your bag, you went to the gym, you were either in a class uh, or you were working out on your own and then you took a shower and you went off to work. It's hard to do that. 10,000 on-demand classes. Tim Shanahan of Peloton says convenience and customization are the company's main selling points. He says the company is growing fast. Sales topped $400 million last year. Canada is its first international expansion. 77% of the Canadian market wants to work out at home. And over 85% of folks want to work out on their own schedule. But don't be surprised if you use it for things other than exercise, such as hanging up your laundry, throwing your clothes on top of. Mo Hagen is the head of innovation for fitness chain Good Life. Typically, consumers will get bored doing that one thing, and they'll seek out a live experience, whether it's group fitness or personal training. Good Life offers virtual classes online, too. But Hagen points to research that proves working out with a group in person elevates endorphin levels beyond just regular exercise. It seems people do get bored. Look at this. There's already a Facebook page devoted to Americans who want to unload their used Peloton bicycle. But Sasha Exeter says she's hooked for life. Is there a chance, though, that you might stop using it? Never. For me, fitness is part of my life. It's my lifestyle. It always will be. Convenience is priceless, in her opinion. Beep, beep. A view Peloton and others are banking on as they try to lay claim to the future of fitness. Diane Buckner, CBC News, Toronto. It may not seem like it here in Metro Vancouver, but in many cities across Canada, gas prices are lower than they've been in years. The national average sitting at $1.03 a litre. The drivers could be in for a big change in the new year. Olivia Stefanovic now on what's driving prices down for now and what Canadians can expect down the road. It's been a while since a trip to the pumps has been this late on the wallet. 
I'm grateful for the, the lower prices. I'm super excited, of course. I can go further and uh, not spend as much money. How does that make you feel? A lot happier than uh, earlier this year. Some of the biggest drops have been seen in Alberta, Nova Scotia and Ontario. A late Christmas present, perhaps, one that Ontario Premier Doug Ford is taking credit for. He claims his government's removal of the province's cap-and-trade program in opposition to a carbon tax are some of the reasons driving down costs. In a statement, his office says they're saving 4.6 cents per litre, and that's being passed on to consumers. But this expert says that's not the only reason. After all, the trend is being seen across the country. There is an oversupply of oil globally. So we now have a glut in oil, and that's why consumers are really uh, becoming the benefactors. Gas prices haven't been this low in the greater Toronto area for years, but don't expect the savings to last. It is going to be a volatile year. I would say an extremely volatile year uh, in which we are going to see peaks and valleys. The explanation? He says prices could go as high as they were in 2014 when it hit a record Canadian average of a buck 41 because of limited oil production around the world and Alberta. The other factor, the federally imposed carbon tax could cause gas stations to raise prices. So all of this means that uh, Canadian prices are more likely to go up than go down. Uh, but of course, we have to be mindful of what's happening globally. He says prices could plummet amid global trade uncertainty. In the meantime, customers are filling up. Hopefully you pay off some of this Christmas debt from all the gift giving. Taking advantage of the extra cash they can save while they still can. Olivia Stavanovich, CBC News, Mississauga, Ontario. By year's end, the total number of illicit drug overdose deaths is expected to meet or even exceed the 1,458 people who died in 2017. Grief and loss have become such deeply inherent parts of the problem that a Ministry of Health-funded agency released two guides to try to help deal with the emotions. So Leslie McBain's son Jordan died in 2014 from an overdose and was one of several people who helped create the guides. She sat down with Anita for a conversation about the crisis. Are you encouraged that anything will actually stop the deaths or that government will make the moves to stop the deaths? That's a good question. I, I think if I didn't think a change could happen in this way, and this is a big change, this is the, you know turning the Titanic, it takes a long time. If I didn't think we would actually get to the point with new policies from the federal government, I couldn't do this work. I, it would be very difficult. To stop the overdose deaths is to provide a regulated, safe supply to people who are dependent on drugs. Uh, to begin with, and that needs to be done in a in a medical way, in a, clin in a with primary care physicians, primary care health care providers. Uh, so we can see the end game, but getting from here to there is going to be a long and difficult task. Are people in your life, or um, you know, those who you know who aren't necessarily involved in um, trying to make this crisis go away, are they surprised that you have that view? given the fact that your son passed away? Sometimes. Uh, sometimes people are surprised, but I think in general the Canadian people are starting to become more and more aware that this uh, is uh, an epidemic not only of addiction but certainly of overdose that crosses all socioeconomic lines. It can be anyone. It can be anyone's child, anyone's partner, anyone's sibling. Um, so once people start to hear the logic behind having a safe supply, uh, they start to understand. Um, I think um, we present a pretty good case for it. Uh, we, we want to stop the deaths. That's, that's the primary goal. Um, and along the way, we, provide, we want to provide um, more treatment, more and better, wider access to treatment, uh, more physicians trained in addictions medicine, all the things that will help support people once they want to recover. But as I say, that the main goal is to stop the deaths. For some people who say it's not realistic for government to bring in policies that regulate the entire drug market, is there another way? Ultimately, no, I don't think so. It, you know, we liken it to uh, prohibition on alcohol. Uh, prohibition did not work. We all know that. And so the government uh, ended prohibition. The same dynamic is true of drugs. 
we have a toxic drug supply, we have people who are addicted, who aren't getting the treatment they need, who are being ignored really. Uh, so if we end prohibition um, and we decriminalize those people who use drugs, there's a whole lot more money available to all levels of government to um, roll out a program that delivers safe product to people. And just, just dollar-wise, it makes perfect sense. And it, uh, it will ultimately reduce the deaths. I mean, I think overdose is with us. It has been for centuries, and it will be, but uh, not like it is now. And for more on the story, you can visit us online at cbc.ca slash bc. There you can read more about the Moms Stop the Harm Network McBain co-founded. Well, the leader of the BC Green Party says he thought it would be difficult working with the NDP. Coming up, what Andrew Weaver is now saying about the relationship in our year-end interview. Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Last night's call was number 141, uh, which is uh, they are two more than our record exhausted. year in 2015. But safe after getting lost on the North Shore Mountains and with the rescue of these two dog walkers early this morning, North Shore Rescue has now broken its record for the highest number of call-outs in a year.
they found a allegedly found a rodent in the um, in the soup. A social media post of a boiled rat in a bowl of soup has left a trendy Gastown restaurant reeling. Was it a nasty surprise or a cruel prank? It's really busy, busy. I would say it's the busiest night of the year. And we hit the road to find out the best ways to get you home safely after ringing in the new year. Why trying to flag a taxi is probably your best option, according to drivers. The leader of the B.C. Green Party says he thought it would be difficult working with the NDP, but Andrew Weaver says this past year has changed his mind. Our Tanya Fletcher sat down with him for a year-end interview earlier this month. So, Andrew, looking back on the past year, first of all, what are you most proud of? And what would you change if you could do things differently? For me personally, um, the announcement on December the 5th of the uh, clean growth strategy, it, which is an economic plan, uh, is a culmination of many, many years' work. Um, so some of the things that perhaps, you know, if, if, if we could have done things differently, I, I would have liked to have seen, um, in terms of the BCNDP bringing legislation forward, that they, that they do so in um, a more uh, regimental fashion throughout the session. You have been in this unique position of holding the balance of power for some time now. On certain issues like proportional representation, it's easy for you to side with the NDP because you agree on that. But on other issues like ride sharing, for example, where you have differing views on the timeline of the rollout and the driver's license requirements, uh, how do you, I guess, reconcile your party stance versus having to prop up the NDP? On the speculation tax, another issue that I worked hard on, when it was first announced in the February budget, it would clearly, in our view, not thought through. And some of the ramifications of it had not been clearly thought through. I spent hundreds and hundreds of hours on this file, bringing information to government, trying to get it to a position such that when they actually introduced legislation, many of the initial concerns were addressed, but not all. And so now we had to actually, you know, there were three critical amendments that I worked with government to try to uh, uh, get in to, to address some issues that we felt were not covered. Our role has been to ensure, like, we want ride hailing here. Um, we want it here sooner than later. I thought that it would be very difficult that we could actually work with the NDP. I come from a campaign in 2017 where it was quite personal, uh, attacking me. Um, I didn't feel that this was going to work very well, but I can tell over the course of this year, um, what has surprised me most is that not only have I seen this work, but it's clear to me that I really like John Horgan. Like, I really like John. I, like, I, I, he's a guy I would go for a beer with. I mean, he's, he, I'm, I have, for a second, if, if there was ever a second that I thought we made a wrong decision, no way. So it sounds like that's an airtight uh, alliance, you might say. What would it take for you to pull that away? I can't see that happening. I honestly don't see that even in the cards. And the reason why I say that in all honesty, I could have, a year ago, I could have seen that happen. A year ago, we could have, you could have asked me that question and I could have said, oh, we're frustrated on this and that. A year later, and I, don't, I, I, just, I just don't see it. I mean, that doesn't mean the government can't be compla should be complacent. And it doesn't mean that there won't be tensions, and it doesn't mean that there won't be disagreements. But it does mean that I just don't realistically see um, this not going the whole full, full term. The CBC's Tanya Fletcher speaking with Green Party leader Andrew Weaver. And we should, of course, mention that that interview was conducted before the results of the electoral reform referendum were released. Well, there you go. Here's a live look of Georgia Street, a very wet Georgia Street in downtown Vancouver on this Friday night at 6.32. Coming up next, we'll have a look at your weekend weather and hear a New Year's Eve message from the Governor General. Stay with us.
Governor General Julie Payette took to the trails in the National Capital Region today to deliver a message of goodwill to all Canadians at year's end. Let us celebrate our good fortune and remember our shared values of openness and tolerance. In this season, let us reach out to those in need, care for those around us, and let's take time, always, to appreciate our loved ones and our communities, for they are most precious. Happy New Year, Canada. Over the past year, the Governor General paid tribute to Canadian troops serving in Ukraine and Latvia and was in Belgium to mark the 100th anniversary of the end of the First World War. She was also on hand to see fellow Canadian astronaut David Saint-Jacques blast off for the International Space Station from Kazakhstan. Well, as we head into the weekend, there is more nasty weather coming our way. Rain on the coast, snow in the interior. Janine is back with your full forecast. Hi, yes, that's right. We're looking at this low pressure system that's moving in from the Pacific. Here's the center of that low. And as I play this out to Saturday as well, you're seeing that this system is bringing in snow to the inland areas. And then along the coast, it's going to be uh, more so a rain story for you. So in fact, we have a few watches and warnings that are in effect for today into tomorrow as the system continues to push through. So let me show you what those are. Snowfall warnings to the north, Prince George, Dawson Creek, 15 to 25 centimeters and reduced visibility because of all that blowing snow. So if you're driving along Highway 97, there is a chance of seeing some whiteout conditions at times. Also, we're looking at uh, Rogers Pass, Eagle Pass, the winter storm warning, about 30 centimeters expected for this area. And then as we head towards the west coast, rainfall warnings uh, for areas highlighted in green 50 to 70 millimeters by the time the system moves through for tonight into tomorrow and then it starts to ease as the system pushes further east towards Alberta. Here's a look at what we can expect for tomorrow's forecast. Still windy and gusty at times. About 20 to 30 millimeters expected for Hope and surrounding areas. Temperatures though fairly mild. 9 degrees for Abbotsford and then 6 for Comox. Chance of precipitation. Rain there for you. And uh, for tomorrow as well we are looking at the potential of snow. 60% chance for Prince George, Cranbrook, some light snow falling there, minus three, still fairly windy, about five centimeters of accumulation we can pick up for Whistler, Kamloops two to four, and then chance of showers as we head towards Port Hardy as well. Here's a rough estimate of what we can uh, expect for those snowfall accumulations and then for the rainfall accumulations too uh, for today into Saturday as well for the model predictions we're looking at closer to 5 to 10 millimeters in some areas. Here's a quick look at your extended forecast average for this time of year 6 degrees chance of showers actually lots of rain uh, moderate in nature heavy at times 20 to 30 millimeters expected for vancouver and then we get a break from it from sunday through tuesday mainly sunny conditions expected there and then as we head into the rest of the week we could see those showers return that's a look at your forecast i'll send it back to you all right Janine, thank you very much well when the worst disasters strike in bc the canadian armed forces were often among those called upon to help that could mean firefighting or earthquake and flood response, all situations that require highly technical skills. So some 300 troopers from the Canadian Army and Army Reserves today found themselves in the rain on the shores of Cultus Lake to practice those skills. And our cameras were there. Got your boats, get ready to launch. This is all about uh, the skills that we need to help Canadians in, in times of need. Uh, typically, th that'll be natural disasters, potentially floods, fires, uh, any kind of a seismic event. <clears throat> These are the things that we, we might need in situations like that. It's not something that either reserves or even regular force, particularly with the rafting, that we get to do all that often. You get to see different types of bridges, different types of assets. The boats that we have behind us can be used to evacuate uh, casualties or transport uh, some equipment that's not too heavy. There's the uh, mobile raft that we're uh, building. We have another one that's the uh, medium Gerber bridge, which is uh, built by hand. It's uh, pretty close to what we can do in a real uh, situation. There are hands-on, kind of fine motor finesse involved for all of these things. And, and doing this every year, uh, 
and, and giving the opportunity for people to come out and refresh on that and review that information and practice those skills is really important. That's what this is all about. It looks like the government shutdown in the United States could drag on into the new year as Donald Trump battles the Democrats to try to fund a wall on the border with Mexico. That's coming up. I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. CBC Vancouver is a proud sponsor of the PUSH International Performing Arts Festival. Expand your horizon and catch groundbreaking performances January 17th to February 3rd. And get your tickets and join CBC Vancouver's Anita Bath and Dan Burrett as they co-host the BIV Top 40 Under 40 Awards on January 24th. For more on these events, check us out online. An Alberta woman detained in China earlier this month has been released and has now returned to Canada. Sarah McIver was taken into custody in China over questions about a work permit related to her teaching job. Her detention came shortly after the arrests of two Canadian men living and working in China. Beijing accused Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor of threatening China's national security. Their arrests were widely regarded as retaliation for Canada's arrest of a tech executive being sought for extradition by the United States. Both Canada and China say McIver's case is different from that of the two Canadian men who remain in Chinese custody. Egyptian security officials say a roadside bomb has hit a tourist bus in an area near the Giza pyramids. Three Vietnamese tourists and their Egyptian guide were killed, 11 others injured. All the tourists on the bus were Vietnamese. No one has claimed responsibility for the attack. This is said to be the first attack to target foreign tourists in Egypt in almost two years. It's an impasse affecting 800,000 American civil servants. Signs point to the partial shutdown of the U.S. government stretching into a second week, possibly into the new year. All because of Donald Trump's ongoing budget battle with Democrats over funding for his border wall. And as Ron Charles reports, today the U.S. president issued a series of threats, raising the stakes even further. 
The U.S. Capitol building sat nearly empty today after lawmakers adjourned for the weekend without a deal to end the government shutdown. Donald Trump's frustration boiled over again on Twitter. We will be forced to close the southern border entirely, he wrote, if the obstructionist Democrats do not give us money to finish the wall. Trump suggested the move would net the U.S. what he called a profit, saying it would bring car manufacturing back across the border from Mexico, taking the U.S. back to the days before NAFTA. Many lawmakers disagree. It would stifle commerce, significant commerce, between our two countries. It benefits both of us. And so I just don't think that he'll follow through. I hope not. Trump also tweeted without offering evidence that a new caravan is forming in Honduras and repeated a threat to cut off all aid to that country, El Salvador and Guatemala. The tweets were too much for some politicians. This is all part of a of total anti-immigrant screed that the president has been on for two years now. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, it should stop. And I'm really glad that the House is now in Democratic hands so that we can have some checks and balances. The administration is also dealing with the fallout from the deaths of two children of Guatemalan migrant families in U.S. custody. Trump's Secretary of Homeland Security, Kirsten Nielsen, visited the border area in Texas today where the families were held. The White House press secretary linked the deaths to the need for immigration reform. It's one of the reasons that the president wants to fix our broken immigration system. Uh, it's a treacherous journey, and we don't want to see people go that route. We want people to come through the legal process uh, so that they're not putting their lives on the line to do this. Trump says instead of heading to Florida with his family, he will remain in Washington through the New Year holiday to deal with the shutdown. So expect more tweets. Ron Charles, CBC News, Washington. A Spanish charity working to rescue migrants adrift in the Mediterranean has docked in the southern port city of Algeciras with more than 300 mostly African travelers aboard. Rescue organizers say the Spanish port was the only one that would take them in after they were turned away from several European countries, including Italy and Malta. The migrants, predominantly from Somalia, Nigeria and Mali, had been plucked from rickety vessels off the coast of Libya a week ago. Spanish authorities will process the migrants and provide them with temporary shelter. Illegal migration to Europe by sea has fallen sharply since 2016, but new landings in Spain have more than doubled to more than 1,000 people per week this year. Boats carrying refugees are also becoming more common on the shores of Britain. And because of the recent surge, today the government declared it a major incident. Dozens of people arriving just this week, making the hazardous crossing from France in small rubber dinghies. Briar Stewart tells us why. From the southeast coast of England, France lies about 50 kilometers beyond the vast expanse of sea. Today calm, but often turbulent and frigid, and now a route for desperate migrants. We're talking about the busiest shipping lane in the world. It's winter. Although the weather looks quite calm at the moment, that could change at any moment, and it's an extremely dangerous journey. Bridget Chapman is with an organization that works with refugees. She says since November, there's been a surge in people making the perilous crossing. This week alone, there were more than 70. This is one of the places where the migrants came. Early yesterday morning, nine people, including three children, were met here by local police and the UK border force. They made the trip in a four meter long, inflatable raft. <laughs> Officials believe the crossings are motivated by increased security around the French port of Calais. It's become increasingly difficult to stow away on a train or truck, so migrants, mostly from Iran, are turning to smugglers to take them across the water. So the danger is this is going to continue to fuel the flames, if you like, of, of illegal entry. As as Tony Brexit. Smith is the former head of the UK Border Force. He says the government needs to step up patrols and work more closely with French authorities. I think we need a joint task force with the French to stop this and put the smugglers out of business because it's not something that border force can manage on their own. Currently only one British patrol boat is surveying the water along with French vessels. More patrol boats is part of the answer, but it's also having um, the resources on the ground we need, working in partnership with the French to identify the gangs, to stop them making the crossings in the first place. Ultimately, 
that's not the solution. We need Chapman to... says both England and France need to do better at processing asylum claims so people don't have to risk their lives. When Alan Kurdi, the, the Kurdish toddler, was washed up on a beach, people were rightly horrified by that. And we're looking at a situation where we could have something like that happening here. She fears if people continue to take to the water, it may only be a matter of time. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Folkestone, England. Well, Christmas may be over, but a blood bank in Quebec is reminding Canadians to keep on giving year-round. The agency is hoping to get more people interested in donating to help those in need. CBC's Brian LaPouz reports. It's Expo 67, the first time Pierre McDuff says he donated blood. The first time was under Mayor Drapeau when he organized the mayor's uh, blood clinic back at the Expo. He says the former mayor inspired him to give. Now he's done so 130 times. The most important to me is the kids, the kids that are in children's hospital. McDuff's blood is type O negative. He says he's a universal donor. He donates any time he can. It's a blood type that's high in demand. If I don't come, they call me. <laughs> Laurent Paul Ménard is the spokesperson for Emma Québec. He says people tend not to think about the holidays. That means hospitals can run low on blood supply and products. We need to have enough supply for those patients who are in critical need uh, during the holidays. Ménard also says Emma Québec is lesser known for its other services. Aside from blood, they supply breast milk for preemies and stem cells. We need stem cells from people to help save the lives of uh, patients who need to receive a stem cell graft. He says hospitals are asking for stem cells from people aged 18 to 35. Meanwhile, McDuff hopes younger people can take the lead and give. Maybe someday I hope I won't need to, but it might be my turn to receive. Brian Lapp with CBC News, Montreal. We have a lot of very old laws in our country, but Ottawa is planning to repeal a number of them, including one that prohibits challenging a person to fight a duel. As CBC's Chris O'Neill Yates tells us, Canada's last duel was in Newfoundland, and it ended with more than one surprising twist. In 1873, St. John's was still a frontier town, a population of about 25,000. There, on a hot August day, the blood of two residents, longtime friends, boiled in rivalry. So on this very site was the last duel in Newfoundland, 1873, and so you had a fellow Dean Dooley and Augustus uh, Healy, and uh, both were smitten by this very same woman. These are two dueling pistols from Newfoundland. It's a last Downstairs in the vault of the Provincial the Museum, pistol. curator Maureen what Power is? brings out a set of dueling like pistols. Pistol. Power says these are likely the very same ones Healy and Dooley would have used, borrowed for the occasion. So Dooley and Healy chose their best friends as seconds to ensure the duel went off properly. But their friends had other ideas. Those two fellows, Bradshaw and Alan, just looked at them and they recognized a, a lifelong friendship and they said, let's see if we can salvage it. And so what they did, they took the pistol balls just before the um, duel, removed the balls. But neither Dooley nor Healy knew what their friends had done. They both turn, they both shoot at the same time, and then Dooley faints. I mean, he just fainted of fright. And then Healy just stood there and he was immediately remorseful because he thought he'd killed his friend. And so they removed themselves and in the newspaper accounts, they went to the higher levels of St. John's to a Casey's farm and that's where they had fisticuffs. Healy won, knocking Dooley out. And I bet you're wondering who won the heart of Miss White. Turns out neither Dooley nor Healy did. As one historian put it, Miss White married a far less belligerent man, one that was less romantic. Chris O'Neill Yates, CBC News, St. John's. Coming up, a classic story on stage in Surrey, where the audience is intentionally and often front and center.
Unique Christmas tradition? My favorite thing to do is make whiskey sours for the whole family, those who are of age. That week after where you get to relax and you get to hang out with your family and stuff, to me that's the best week of it. Well, you have likely read the fairy tale Hansel and Gretel. So there's also a good chance you've even seen a live performance at one time or another, but you've probably never seen it quite like this. At the Surrey Arts Center, they're putting on a version of the classic story with a twist. As Jesse Johnson reports, what makes this play so unique isn't what's happening on stage, it's the audience. Ask any thespian, and they'll tell you the best way to start a play, by far, is some good old-fashioned breakdancing. Now, just before the curtain goes up, it's time for an introduction. So please, if we can take out the main curtain and we'll meet all the people who are going to bring you the show tonight. Well, that's different. The actors let the audience in on all of their secrets before the play begins. The weapons are fake, the scary monsters aren't really scary at all, and the villains are just actors, nice actors who are pretending to be mean. That doesn't seem to affect the reviews from young critics. I just like all the creativity and stuff on it, the stage. I might mean, like when the grandma spanks everybody in the school. I like when the grandma spanks Charlie a couple times. They also like the crowd participation, and there's lots of it, which makes sense because this show is all about inclusion. a relaxed performance. Everyone is welcome, but special invitations go out to those with autistic spectrum conditions, anxiety issues, or learning disabilities. If you feel like yelling or going for a wander during the show, no problem. The challenges are, I don't know, they're far and in between. It's either the noise or, for example, my lovely sister who likes to walk around the entire theater, touch the stage. Those challenges, of course, are completely outweighed by the benefits of a show like this, especially for Weltson, who gets to perform for her sister. So that's kind of what's important to me, because I don't get to do that, because uh, she's not like other sisters. So it's kind of nice to see what are the moments that I can make her laugh or her respond. If you're an actor, applause always feels good after a show. But tonight... Do you want my autograph? It feels just a little bit better. Yeah, it's so much fun. Jesse Johnston, CBC News, Surrey. Thank you very much. Looks good. Well, thanks for watching tonight. You can always find our news program online at cbc.ca slash bc. Our next local news right here at 11 o'clock with Dan Burrett after the national. Have a good night.